So how many people in this room are in the edu or have been in the education field, not as a student? Oh man, you're gonna have a blast. All right, so she's actually really, really excited about this. So a huge appreciation for Joanne Dye, who is a docent at the Dolly and an incredible math teacher for coming and sharing with us. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you for having me, first and foremost. I really appreciate that. It's, it's so nice. Uh, like she said, I am a docent at the Dolly Museum. I give tours typically on Fridays at 12.30, unless I have a meeting at work, and then that, that kind of goes by the wayside. But uh, I do do general tours. However, I'm kind of like the math person there. So I've done um, quite a few presentations on Dolly's mathematical mind. Um, I did one at the Ocala Museum just recently. They had me come up and give a talk there, so it's pretty exciting. Um, at my my degree is in mathematics, but I have a minor in music and art. Um, and I also teach a class at Hillsborough Community College called uh, Dolly and His Use of Math and Science and Psychology. So um, it's pretty fun. Yeah. I, I enjoy this, honestly. <laughs> it's, it's fun for me. So today I'm going to present to you Dolly's mathematical mind, as you can tell. Um, and before I get into it, I just want to give you a list of people who are important to Dolly and who inspired him. Um, some people he personally knew, and obviously there's a couple that you know were long before. gone, way before he met them. But uh, Senor Treyer, we'll talk about him in a, in a couple minutes. Um, Werner Carl Heisenberg. How many people know who he is? Oh, yeah, a couple yeah. of you do. Good. Okay. This is fantastic. Leonardo da Vinci. You all know we who all he know is. Who <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm going to plug your piece. Okay. There's a Vitruvian man oh, really? in this piece. Yes. <laughs> uh, Prince Mattia Gika. We'll talk about him a little bit in detail. And uh, Thomas Spanchoff. So those are kind of Dolly's stars when we're talking about Dolly and Matt. Uh, all right. So my first person up the bat is Senor Treyer. He was Dolly's teacher. Now, uh, Salvador Dolly's father was pretty wealthy. He'd be considered today to be a lawyer. And his father wanted his son to go to a public school, not a private school, as, his, as uh, Dolly's mother wanted him to go to, um, because his father thought it would be good for him to go to the school. And Dolly's father had a friend, and his name was Senor Treyer. And uh, they would kind of meet every once in a while in the house. And Dolly described Senor Treyer's room, his, his den, if you will, as the cave of treasures. Oh. And it had all these oddities in there. There's like a, an egg on a string, you know, like a frog in some motor hide, uh, things like that, just weird things. One of which thing that really caught Dolly's eye was a stereoscope here. And this is just a, an image of one. But Dolly claimed that he picked up the stereoscope, looked inside of it, and he saw this little Russian girl bathed in furs on a sled being pushed through the snow. And that became his dream girl. So this also inspired him into optics. He was very interested in why does this work? What's the mathematics behind it? So at a very young age, he started getting very interested in optical sciences, if you will. Uh, the next person I'm going to talk about is Leonardo da Vinci. And I did put a lot of Leonardo da Vinci in here because right now at the Dolly Museum we have an exhibit going in tandem, Dolly and Da Vinci. So uh, that's why there's a lot of Til that August, in there. Right? What's that? Till August. Yes. Uh, no, no, July 26th is the mm -hmm. date that it ends. But if you guys are mathematicians or interested in math, you may like MC Escher. Yeah. We're getting that show. So oh, I'm wow. pretty stoked. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Excited. <laughs> uh, so Leonardo Da Vinci. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was a Renaissance master, as most of you know. I'm not telling you guys probably something you don't know already. Uh, but he was, he was uh, interested, even though he never wrote about it, in the Golden Ratio because his roommate wrote a book on the divine proportion, which is the Golden Ratio, which is a mathematical uh, concept that I'll talk about later. It increases or enhances um, visual beauty. So, Very much. yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and Da Vinci also did anamorphic art. Do you guys know what that is? No. No, uh, anamorphic art is when you have this image that's like um, morphed. 
and, and you put like a, a mirrored cylinder in front of it and then it resolves itself. Have you ever seen oh. anything like that? Mm -hmm. Or like you, you take an image and you stretch it out and you have to stand at a particular angle to, to see, see it resolve. Like a lot of street uh, chalk artists on Absolutely, and yeah. Animals. Or even um, some where when it says stop, like on the ground, is anamorphic art because you have to stretch it so it resolves like when you're looking at it at a particular angle. So Leonardo da Vinci actually did some of this artwork. Uh, he wasn't the first one to do it, but you know he, he was interested in it as well. Um, we could have a whole talk on Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. truly. Uh, I'm going to move on, but Werner Karl Heisenberg was a physicist. Uh, he's a quantum physicist, and he becomes Dolly's new father. Uh, and I have that in quotes because Dolly was very, very interested in the uh, 20, late 20s, early 30s in uh, Sigmund Freud. Yeah. So when the bomb drops to end the war, it heralds in um, nuclear physics. So Dolly becomes very interested in the work of um, Heisenberg. Another person we're going to see a little bit later is the Prince Mattia Gika and his connection with the Golden Ratio. This was Dolly's mathematician was his friend. He met him at a party in San Diego. He was at this Hollywood bash, pretty much, and uh, he met, he was sitting next to him. And they got to talking, and he's like, oh, I wrote a book on the divine proportion. Would you like to read it? Dolly's like, absolutely, send it to me. And the rest is history on that. Uh, I, I, I just imagine him probably thinking that Dolly won't, re you know, probably wouldn't read it. But wow, was he wrong, right? Uh, what is he, the principal? <laughs> you know what? You're asking me a question. I think I want to say it's 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 an Eastern European country. Well, it's like Romanian or something. I think yeah. he may be from Romania, but I'm not 100 percent certain. But we'll I can Google look that up out. for you and tell it's you. Like I should know that. <laughs> shame on me. Shame, shame, shame. But no, I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'll be honest with you. Um, but yeah, if I don't know something, I will tell you straight out. But. I'm pretty sure you are right. I think he is Romanian. Or you are right. Okay. Uh, Thomas Banchoff. This gentleman works at Brown University. Some of you guys are shaking your head yes. And he does a lot of work on the fourth dimension. Uh, this man is brilliant. He's still living. He still teaches at Brown University. And I've met him personally, and he's wonderful. So if, if you see that he comes to the Dolly, you guys definitely will want to see Welcome. him. Mm hmm uh, so those are the people that inspire. Is that your I don't know. It should be. <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. Uh, so Dolly and the nuclear mysticism. This is geometric, atomic examples. Okay. So what? Yeah, I know this is wow. kind of a lot, a lot of words here. I'll, I'll get into it. I promise you. So what That's happens okay, is the atomic bomb drops. Okay, which is horrible in many ways, okay, but it did herald in nuclear physics, okay. So Dolly's interest, and excuse the pun, materialized uh, in 1945. Uh, when, like I said, the bomb dropped and he became very interested in this. You have to understand that Dolly would read science and math books extensively before this. So this really just ramped it up for him. Uh, literally when Dolly died, he had a mathematical book read beside his bedstand. So he was very interested in both topics. Um, so people who embraced atomic research had disdain for it because of the atrocity, you know, that happened in Japan. But Dolly, at this point, he takes no moral stance. He's like, I'm not going to get involved with this. Uh, so he likes the idea behind atomic research. And he says, this is Dolly, in order for art to be cutting edge, it should contain these elements of nuclear science. Um, so Dolly recognizes that there's a discontinuity of matter, okay? And he says that on an atomic level, nothing's touching. And we'll talk about Heisenberg at this point, and, well, in a little bit. Um, so Dolly's artwork is going to kind of show this notion. So when we look at it, we're going to see things that are not touching, things that are separated. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, he also embraces the philosophical ideas of quantum mysticism and the ex explanation of consciousness. They have to understand he was following Freud. Mm -hmm. And Freud was very much talking about the subconscious mind, the dreamy mind. So 
it's really, when you think about it, it's a different way to look at things because quantum physics says that there's several possibilities at every single moment of time. So your reality is based off your perception and we can all have different perceptions, but it's our reality. So this is kind of like an interesting topic. Uh, and it's very key to this movement for Dolly, okay? Because reality versus perceived reality is what he wants to convey, okay? He wants you to believe in his reality or what he paints, mm -hmm. okay? So through mathematics and science proves the existence of God. So Dolly Watt writes his manifesto and that's what he claims. So I'm, I'm very much using Reader's Digest version here, okay? So through math and science prove the existence of God, okay? Uh, Dolly likes to distort reality and take the viewer into his own reality, like I said. So you want to see some images? You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a Madonna of Portland Ligat. Uh, 1949, you can see that things are separated out. Uh, things aren't touching. Uh, you notice he, he's using the style of Renaissance masters? Yes. Very much on purpose. Yeah. Okay, very much so. Uh, Lita Atomica. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we're talking about the golden ratio. This is really heavily involved in this piece. Uh, but Lita Atomica, Lita the Swan. Some of you guys are shaking your head. Yes, that's what it's about. Uh, once again, things are levitating. Okay. Uh, here's one of my favorite pieces coming up. This is Raphael's head yeah. exploding. Oh, thank you. And you Absolutely. can see nothing's touching. I love this piece. I it's too. one of my favorites. Uh, What's really cool about this piece is Dolly is so clever to make his double image. He utilizes architecture. Yeah. So the Pantheon in Rome, has anybody been there? Raise your hand if you've been there. You've been there, yes. And it has a big hole in the ceiling, right? It's an architectural wonder. And the light comes through it. So he creates this Raphaelesque head exploding with the, par the I almost said Pantheon. Pantheon. I almost said Parthenon. So pretty amazing, right? Awesome. Uh, this piece we have at the museum, it's called the Wheel Barrels, and it's once again based off of that. I've never seen that piece before. Wow. We have many pieces and they rotate them in and out. I've been so. there a variety of times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joan Croft is our curator, so she, she definitely tries to switch it up. So I'm not surprised if you, you haven't seen it. Uh, we have many, many, many paintings. Well, not paintings, but etchings. Um, Galatea of Spheres. Another one that's quite fine, but you see that whole nothing's touching. We have this kind of atomic movement in it. Um, maximum speed of Raphael's Madonna. This is Raphael, and this is Dali's take on it. So he, he takes Raphael's work and puts it on a nuclear spin on it. So it's that's like a just crown down, kind of the base of Yes. Yes. Yeah. And You'll see through math and science proof the existence of God, so he'll have some kind of religious aspects in it. His mother was um, a, a Catholic, and his father was atheist. <laughs> and Dolly, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing because Dolly, when he's in surrealism, has well, he disdain didn't really. for religion. And then when he gets older, he comes back to religion, but not completely. Like in interviews, he won't say that he doesn't believe in God, but he doesn't say that he does either. So it's an interesting thing, but he does put religious. Um, Icon. icons, <coughs> especially the uh, Catholic nature in his pieces. Um, this is the golden ratio. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So now I'm going to explain to you some of the underlying mathematics. How many people know what this is? Golden ratio? A couple of you guys do. Okay. It's also known as the divine proportion. Okay. Um, so the golden ratio, just to give, uh, for the people that don't know what it is, just to kind of give you the underlying sense before I, I go and show you the grid lines, because you're going to be like, what the heck is this? You know, the ancient Greeks were the ones that came up with this idea. Uh, well, at least they're, they're credited. Because the Egyptians, if you look at their architecture, it's, it's kind of hard to say that they didn't know about it. You know, so I, I don't want to say that strongly, but they're, they're credited. Everything has to be the right shape to make it perfect. Or look perfect. Right, like some kind of a visual symmetry. And yes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, they utilize this knowledge to create works of art in designing architecture. Uh, it's also known as phi. Yeah. And that's the symbol right here. Mm -hmm. And then the idea of the golden ratio was lost throughout the Middle Ages. 
So I'll, I'll show you the mathematics behind this. So we're going to actually see how this is created or how they came up with it. This is just kind of a, I guess, a um, over, yeah, just mm -hmm. an overview. overview. Mm -hmm. um, the idea resurfaced in, in the Renaissance, at least in Western art. Uh, Raphael knew about it. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo all knew about phi. Um, and they positioned their um, subjects on their canvas to relate this idea, so it became more visually attractive to the eye. Uh, Salvador Dali knew about it, and he knew about it from studying in art school, but also from Mattia Giga and his book. So um, he really utilizes it in the nuclear mysticism period. So we have, you know, he purposely used the golden ratio to make things more aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, all right, so. Here's some mathematics. If you have a line segment AB, okay, and we're, we're going to do a ratio, small to large and then large to total, and then we're going to cross multiply and we'll get a quadratic equation, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, this red line is a division, okay? So what's a small piece? 1B. Just one, one, one. yeah, yeah, one, okay? Mm -hmm. What's a large piece? G. G, good. What, and then large is G again, mm -hmm. and it's going to be over the total. How do we get the total this? G plus, one. G plus, G plus one. one. Absolutely. Good. Awesome. So it would be 1G or G1? Or 1 plus G. Okay. So we're going to add them together to get the whole the whole piece, and there, okay. that's what we get. Yeah. So if we cross multiply, we get G times G, which is G squared, and then we get 1 times 1 plus G, so it's 1 plus G, right? So. With quadratic equations, if you're not a math person, it's okay. All right, don't worry about it. But we're mm -hmm. going to set it all equal to zero, uh, and then we use the quadratic formula to get one plus or minus square root of five over two. That is phi. Mm -hmm. That is phi. Okay. So if you're like, okay, so what? <laughs> like, so so what does that mean? Uh, it's probably easier to put it in a decimal form. So Maybe. one point six one eight. I'm truncating it. Uh, of course, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. And then 0.618 is feet. So those are the two numbers you have to know. 1.618, 0.618. Cool? Everybody good? All right. So what that means is if I have those dimensions, I can create different shapes, a golden rectangle, golden triangle, and there's two different ones that you can see, examples. So what does that mean? So let's use the rectangle because that's probably the easiest one to look at. If I take length divided by width, I'm going to get 1.618, right? So if I put a bunch of rectangles up on the wall and only one of them have those dimensions and I asked you what's the mo most attractive rectangle, that's, be the one. that's usually the one people choose. Because it's the most symmetric and balanced. It's, it's balanced and your eye perceives it. Uh, there was, and I don't remember the name of, of this, this study, but there's a study in Germany where they used uh, Photoshop to manipulate a person, so the person didn't exist. And the one yeah. person's um, facial features were based off the golden ratio. And then what he did was manipulate it. So he pulled the eyes, Everything you know, over a little bit, made the nose a little bit longer, and then put all the images up on the wall and asked the test subjects to pick the most attractive one. And guess which one they picked? The golden ratio yeah, one. Okay. I'm going to give you my disclaimer. Just because something doesn't follow the golden ratio does not mean it's not attractive. Okay, Angelina Jolie is a good example. She's beautiful, yep. but her face does not follow the golden ratio. To not each at all. A little bit, a little bit. It, it has some of her faces, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm just giving you that disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> her lips fine. <laughs> actually, probably not. <laughs> no, that's where that's actually where she falls. But that's okay. Um, an example of someone who does would be um, Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. His face is, according That's to the golden ratio, is, is perfect. Um, Halle Berry, there's another example. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving you some, some examples. Because the look character is perfect. <laughs> yeah, where do you look that up? Yeah. Uh, you can look online. Just uh, <laughs> yeah. type in celebrity and golden ratio, and boom, it comes up. <laughs> mm. Someone yeah, figured that out. Yeah. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. Hey, people have some time on their hands, you know? Uh, <laughs> so golden ratio and <laughs> connections to the star and pentagon. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. The the, uh, the line segments are once again based on phi. So the ancient Greeks were really excited about the pentagon because it's like perfect shape. Okay, perfect shape. The star as well. In fact, the Pythagoreans 
would have a star on their palm to gain access into their group. So it's because it's perfect. Okay, it's seen as a perfect shape. All right, um, next. Okay, so I'm just giving you some examples from ancient Greece. Um, the Parthenon, they used the golden ratio to create it. Uh, and I'm going to show you. Here's here, you guys see the. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. And then the whole shape itself is a golden rectangle. And then we can subdivide again, and we get this. So mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. Um, let's go to the Renaissance masters. Guess who I'm going to pull up? What what image do you think I'm going to show you? Renaissance masters, the most famous painting of all times. Well, the of that, Renaissance. Oh. Uh, Mona, Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. Yes. Yes. Last Supper is fine too. Uh, in fact, I think I have faces, one. Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. So Mona Lisa, here's a golden um, triangle. Uh, by the way, we haven't looked at the golden spiral yet, but this yeah. is what's known as a golden spiral. I will show you some things about this. It's really neat. Uh, Vitruvian Man. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Uh, so it's showing the line segment of his arm. Mm -hmm. It's showing the golden ratio. We had that segment A to B. Um, so some some sometimes if you measure off your body we'll find the golden ratio in it as well and there's the Trubian man again with golden ratio rectangles so just showing you some examples of that uh, Lita and the swan this is by Leonardo da Vinci and the reason why I'm showing you is because Dolly also did Lita and the swan uh, so I found this online it was in an article but the um, the scholar put the grid lines on top of it, and all the grid lines are based off of the golden ratio, showing how she she works, how it works. Um, this is Dolly's take on Lita Atomica, which is Lita in the Swan. Do you guys see? Yeah, it's hard to see, but yeah. The Pentagon. Mm -hmm. We have this actually in the museum right now. Um, not the original painting. It's a reproduction of the original painting, and it has next to it Dolly's sketch up of, of uh, what he wanted people to see. Um, Michelangelo, the Holy Family, we also see that uh, star base beneath it. And you guys said the Last Supper, there you go, <laughs> it's based off of the golden ratio. Okay, and Dolly, he does the Last Supper. Have you guys seen it? Anybody seen yes. this piece? Yes. It's called the Sacrament of the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And... Oh. It is actually, this painting is in Washington, D.C. And they're not allowed to lend it out. <laughs> but the, the person it? who gave it to them was like, you can never lend it out. It's it's probably huge. It's about this big. Oh, that's it? Yeah. That's small. So, but uh, huh. I put Geeka's grid lines. Those grid lines are based off the golden ratio on top of it. And you can see that it works according to the golden ratio. Um, Raphael's the Copper Madonna. Uh, you know how you asked me, well, how do they know if the face works? There's a mask that you can put over top of it. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And there's a golden yes. ratio mask. So um, it's placed over top of, of her face, and you can see that it fits. Okay? So if her lips were, you know, down here, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. work. Exactly. So all the, the um, different parts of her face have to fit in that mask. Does that make sense, everybody? Are you guys okay? Yeah. Are we good? Okay. Makes the brain so, go. Gika, this is his book, uh, The Geometry of Art and Life, and this is a book that he gave to Dolly uh, to read, and this is an example of one of the pages out of his book. So he, too, made a grid line, you know, off of, uh, for a face, and mm -hmm. placed it over top of this woman here who's attractive to show that her face works according to the golden ratio. Um, Giga's grid lines, what I did was I went into Photoshop mm -hmm. and just basically traced them. Okay? That worked. And what I did was I started putting them over top of Dolly's painting so we can see if they work. So basically with these grid lines, we're going to look for those intersection points and we're going to see how they basically, how Dolly is using the intersection points to create his artwork. So he's using the golden ratio. This painting is a kingpin for nuclear okay. mysticism but it's nature more vivant uh, and we can see some of the spots where things are hitting see what I mean mm -hmm. you know and Dolly 
utilized the golden ratio extensively in this painting. So that's the underlying mathematics behind this particular painting. And you see everything is levitating. So we talked about that, you know, nuclear mysticism of things on a subatomic level, nothing's touching. Um, so here's the ecumenical council. We have this painting as well at the museum. And here's Gika's grid line. So I just wanted to show you how the overlay is showing things uh, intersecting at points to make it more vis visually appealing to the eye. Um, just for fun, I put it over top of the hallucinogenic Toreador, which is one of our most famous paintings there. And guess what? It lines up. It lines up. I wasn't surprised, honestly. Uh, I love that painting. And are you ready for this? You ready for this title? Anybody want to yeah. give a shot at it? Sure. Go, on. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So you got the DNA. Uh huh. So galaxy, galaxy, that's the right nucleic acid. <laughs> yeah. It's a mouthful. <laughs> He's very proud of this title, by the way. Uh, it's homage to Crick and Watson. What did Crick and Watson do? Discovered DNA. They absolutely did. So this is homage to them, but uh, he puts his wife's name, Gala. Yes. Dali. You see it? Yes. Alcide. Do you guys know who Alcide is? Mm. It's Alcide. Yeah. Do you guys know who he is? No. I wasn't sure until I started working there. He was a... Um, we eat nails. Yeah, yeah, he was a knight. Yeah. Right? And he unified Spain. There's a, there's a movie uh, called Alcide. I have not seen it. Is it good? Oh, yeah. I don't have to they see that movie. up on this horse it's at the before, before your time. <laughs> oh, well, so I don't care. I like, I like movies. It's like, I like Metropolis. Movie. That's from, like, what, 1928, and I think? No, it's fine. Yeah, that's okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, well, I'll but have to see this movie. Is, oh, is it fantastic? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I like movies. I go to Tampa Theater all the time because they have some great old movies there. But uh, at any rate, so he unites Spain, and that's where Dolly is from. He's mm -hmm. Spanish. very proud of it. So, uh, once again, you can see the grid lines, the underlying grid lines showing the mathematical. Um, I'm sorry, why is that homage to Crick and Watson? Oh, because of the well, sequence? this yeah, is about DNA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a DNA, this, this paint, the painting is huge, okay? Yeah. This is not doing any justice whatsoever. But there's, there's DNA strands over here. Okay. So, yeah, basically, this painting is about life, mm -hmm. death. Yeah, it's very hard to see, especially with the grid lines mm -hmm. on top. That's a crystal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's supposed to represent, and if you're, if you're a chemistry person, you're like, no way. But Dolly said it's supposed to represent uh, salt crystals. Oh. Because if you put salt on a crop, it kills it. So yeah. this is death. This side this of painting is, is life. And then the resurrection is in the center. Oh. So, yeah. So it's pretty it's cool painting. By the way, he knew Crick and Watson. Wow, he called that's them. pretty cool to come over and talk to him because he <laughs> lived in New York City at the St. Regis and Crick and Watson were like, why is he calling me? This looks weird. You know, what's up with this? So they were kind of skeptical, but they went. They were like, oh, I'm going to go check this out. And Dolly took them up to the penthouse and um, he would he talked to them about their findings. He was very interested. He's like, I'm just fascinating with this. You know, can you tell me more? So. Well, I knew Francis Crick. He worked at the Salk Institute when he was there. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Yeah. That's so, cool. Yeah. And we were both neurobiologists at the end of the slide. Yeah. I mean, I was. It was I wasn't at the end of my life, but he was, <laughs> <laughs> he, was at, he was at the end of his, and he went into neurobiology at the end, was trying to figure out the brain, considered it the, the final frontier, you know, every then DNA, you didn't know what else to do, so he <laughs> flung really himself into the brain, and that's where I was. So, um, anyway, so I can take more stories. Wow. Do you have any pictures? Yeah, so. Did you get pictures of him with you? Did you? Oh, in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting thing. I love Florida for this reason. Because okay. you meet people and you meet such fascinating people here. It's crazy. I met a bullfighter the other day. I'm like, oh, interesting. Wow, that's cool. Yes. Crazy. So, love it. I'm going to have museum? to talk to you afterwards. Yes, he's one of, of our guards. Course. I have yes. seen him <laughs> talk to him several times, and one of my friends said, hey, you know he's a bullfighter. I'm like, nah. -uh. Where's he from? 
I'm not, not sure. Here. Mexico, no. probably. No, I know. Well, I Spain think or Spain. anywhere in Central maybe. South America. I'm not sure. I think it may be Ecuador. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Too. So, um, Velasquez. Yeah, Velasquez. Dolly absolutely loves him. He and loves so does Picasso, him. by the way. They, like, worship Velasquez. But uh, Dolly does a take on Velasquez, and I just put these lines to show you that she works. Yeah. Princess does meet up to the golden ratio. Mm -hmm. And then Venus de Milo with drawers, which is in the Da Vinci exhibit, it's in the, the breathing room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that room is yeah. crazy. It creeps me out, actually. I'm like, I can't stand it there for a while because I can't stand that breathing sound. I'm like, but at any rate, it's <laughs> a really cool room. But Venus de Milo works. Um, all right. DNA and the golden ratio connection. Are you guys ready to be blown away? Well, maybe not you. <laughs> you probably won't be. But, uh, so, you know, I, I started studying golden ratio. I was talking to my classes about it. Um, and I found out that it's actually in DNA. And uh, this is Dolly. That's a close-up of that painting. Yes. Galaxy Dolly, so you can kind of see it a little bit better. And then here's a persistence of memory. That's the painting that put Dolly on the map, basically. That's in New York City at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, but here's a DNA double helix. By the way, if you, you guys have been to our museum, right? Mm hmm Okay. You know the staircase? Yes. It's supposed to represent mm -hmm. DNA. So it makes you feel off yes. when you go so up. Like, yeah. I mean, if I take a kid, kids on tour, I make them count the steps. <laughs> it keeps them busy. <laughs> yeah, because they get Well, there's 63 steps. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dolly, you remember I showed you the Churmort Vivant? Here's a close-up of the roll. It's twisting, and it's meant to look like a DNA strand. In that same painting, let me go back here, is a banister, which is also supposed to symbolize the DNA strand. Dolly was the first person to paint, like consciously paint DNA uh, in his paintings. So that's why I like the Chormort Vivant. It's a great painting because it has a lot of really interesting things. Okay, so I'm going to skip this one because we already saw the double helix. Here shows the golden ratio with the DNA strand. I was like, really? That is crazy. Isn't that crazy? I think it is. Do you know the ancient Greeks believed that, you, you remember the, the fates, and they pulled mm -hmm. a line and cut yes. it? They know now that if, if you look at your DNA, depending on how long it is, unless you get into an accident, they'll tell you how long you're going to live. They can figure it out now. I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't know about you guys. Like, I'd rather just live life. Well, I, I just have to look at the women in my it's family and get a good guess. The little ends of the DNA tell you how long you're going to live. They're called telomeres. Wow. They're the little, <coughs> like, they're kind of like the fingers on your hand or something. Yeah. yeah. They're the little things that stick off the ends of your DNA, uh -huh. the end pieces, and we've known for a while now that they seem to indicate how many lifetimes you have left. Because remember, when, well, you don't remember, but when I was young <laughs> doing that stuff, uh, we could only keep cells growing in tissue culture for so long, and we didn't know why. They would go for so a while, and then they would poop out on us, you know. And it turned out that uh, if we could have counted their telomeres, we would have known, because what was happening in, in vitro in these dishes is they, these little pieces of DNA were getting knocked off quicker than oh, they wow. should have. And so they were getting to the point where then they couldn't go anymore. And, uh, and so then we figured out that in our lifespan, too, things happen to us that we're exposed to. It's called epigenetics that affects um, this uh, aspect of our DNA, and this is one of the things that determines our longevity. And, well, it's a long story, and I have to go into more of it. Uh, but this is how we're figuring out that the things we actually do eat and do to ourselves affect us, yeah. and make us live longer or shorter, sure. because they do affect this part of our DNA, as well as mutating the DNA, which has another aspect to, to it in terms of you know how long we'll live, yeah. so, you know, whether we'll contract certain diseases, and you know what the chances are cancers and so forth popping up, but... Um, that's, that's one of their primary mechanisms is that the more cell divides, the more mutations that um, exactly. the telomere says, okay, you've divided enough, you're probably going to get your cancer soon. So stop that's that. right, it'll so stop, you, stop you in your place, you know, if you've, if you've divided too much, you're, you're mm -hmm. done. You're done. And so that's why we could only go so far in the our tissue cultures long ago, you know. This is fascinating. It is. Yeah. I love this group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you regenerate the telomeres, cells, some of the that's right. So that's what we've learned to do now, is we've found ways to activate the enzymes that add those little pieces back on, 
protect them or do something like that to increase our longevity. Longer. Yeah, you know, allow our, allow the cells to grow longer and so things like that. This is great. I'm loving it. So are you taking appointments? This is fantastic. They are making such inroads. Oh my gosh, that's just even a tiny little bit. This is amazing. I love. I love this. This is. I'm. I like when I learn. So, I'm loving it. You have to write that down. Because I sometimes talk about a painting and you mention that. It's really neat. Um, all right. So you saw this. You guys have seen the stairwell. So I'm going to go through this kind of fast. Hey, I've never seen the museum look like this, by the way. Unless there's no one, absolutely nobody there, which is rare. Yeah, th in that area, because yeah. it's very condensed. It's very hard to move through. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, it would have been nicer if it was a little more open. A little bit more open. Yeah, like that room that's behind there, they should have just incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> the gift shop takes up like the largest Oh, like half, uh, all of that whole section, but the oh, other yeah. section has, you know, the auditorium, and then, yeah, they should have gone under. A really quick thing that you probably don't know, like this is a behind the scenes, if you will. Um, we don't have any closets. No closets. I believe that. Yeah, I believe that too. The way that it's shaped and stuff, there's just, it. it's beautiful, but the functioning. <laughs> <laughs> I like the look of it, though. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful, but I hated being in there. It's like heels for women. They're beautiful, but they, they're, they're horrible functional. to wear. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so Fibonacci numbers in relation to the golden ratio. This is a visual and an analytical approach to it. So Fibonacci, uh, some of you probably already know the sequence. I can tell by this crowd, you guys probably already know what it is. But it's zero. Yeah, well, sometimes in math books they start with zero. Sometimes they don't start with one. It just depends on who you're reading. Uh, so 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. What's the next number? 89 is correct. Oh. How do we get that? Adding the last two. Yeah, so if you add, for instance, one plus one, you're going to get two. Two, two and two one, one is three. Three and two is five. Yeah. Yeah. So you can keep on going on yeah. and on forever, basically. But uh, Fibonacci numbers can be seen in the spirals of, um, oh, okay, I can make sure that wasn't showing up. Uh, stems of palm trees. Pine cones, artichokes, bromeliads. I mean, they're all over the place. In fact, our gardener, Nicole, at the Dolly Museum, she's very much obviously into plants, but she likes the golden ratio and she oh, was showing nice. them bromeliads. They grow that way because if their their um, leaves are spaced according to the golden ratio apart, they get the most sunlight. So it's pretty mm -hmm. neat. Yeah, we had sunflowers too. I don't know, I don't think they're blooming yet. But uh, here's the analytical approach first. So if we take the numbers and we divide the Fibonacci sequence, uh, we're going to get a ratio. And let's see what happens. So if we divide 1 by 1, we get mm -hmm. one. 1, right? 2 divided by 1 is 2. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. And so on and so forth. What do you notice oh, is wow. happening? Golden rule. Yeah, the golden ratio. So the higher you go up in the Fibonacci sequence, it rests. Yeah, the closer it gets. So I made a chart. Never quite good yet. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> limit. It's a limit, right? It approaches it. So I made a chart just showing you how it kind of settles really close. Uh, and have once ever, again. Have you ever transformed that to see frequencies? No. That would be because cool. It, it looks like an FID. It isn't. Rob, that's on you, bro. He's an electrical engineer, <laughs> so I'm like, if you could do that easily, right? <laughs> See? <laughs> I'm like, hey. Uh, all right. So basically, that's an analytical.